Hi, good morning, everyone. How's it going? Welcome to my studio. I'm Ursula Gullo. It's good to see you today. We are going to be doing self portraits. Um, I don't know about you all, but I had a busy week last week and I have a busy week coming up. So I wanted to keep this really low key. Um, and just do something that I love to do, which is self-portraiture. So, um, and we'll be talking about the tradition of self-portraiture um, and women artists uh, specifically, because today is International Women's Day. So thanks for joining and what you can do to prepare. I'm gonna be using markers and paint, acrylic paint, and you, you'll want to either work from a photograph or I like working from a live image. So I have a mirror over here that I'm working from. Um, so I leave that up to you. And if you want to have collage papers or if you want to just work with pencil and just draw today, that's fine. I'm really just gonna like leave it open to you. I think if anything, you know, it's more about the spirit which you approach your self-portrait today. Keeping an open mind, um, keeping, you know, don't have super high expectations, making some like classical realist, photorealist self-portraiture. Be expressive and enjoy the process. So I am going to be working on this little pad of canvas paper and I'm going to be facing this down like this and I'm actually going to try something new today where I'm going to try to do this upside down. I did a live stream the other day and someone was complaining that it was, <laughs> they couldn't see the image the correct way. So I'm going to try doing it upside down. So if you have a photograph, sometimes a really good thing to try is to turn the, the picture upside down and um, try drawing it upside down or painting it or interpreting it upside down. Um, it's a really good way to disassociate your thinking mind from what you're looking at. So you start to look a little bit closer if you're not drawing what you think you should be drawing. You're drawing what you're seeing. So yeah, that can be a fun way to, um, yeah, disconnect yourself from your subject matter. Okay, so I'm gonna load up some paints to start with. I have white. I'm gonna give myself some titanium white, or I'm sorry, Naples yellow also, which is this off white. Um, I'm going to do some cadmium red light. Some alizarin crimson. Cadmium yellow medium. And I'm not going to use black. I'm going to use some burnt umber. Oof, can't get this open. And a dark blue. Ultramarine blue is a good one to use for portrait painting. Um, I think I only have phthalo blue, which is a very like. Uh, turquoisey color. Oh, maybe I have a little, I do have some ultramarine. And then I also have some phthalo green on my palette that I might use a little bit of. Another good color to put down if you have it is burnt sienna.
But I really have no idea where this is going to go today. Like I said, I'm going to just keep it really low key, low pressure. Um, it's been a busy week in my studio. So I've actually been working with oils this past week. So there's like a little bit of an oil uh, fume smell going on in here, which is kind of nice. But um, yeah, it's interesting to switch back and forth between acrylics and oils. Um, okay, so I'm going to tilt this down now. And like I said, you can work from a mirror. You can work from um, a photograph if you wish. I have a mirror over here I'm going to be working from. And I'm going to try to work upside down. I'm actually going to start this with marker. I'm going to start this with a drawing. Let's see. I love this color. This is like a phthalo green color. So I'm not going to be too like realistic with my colors. Today I'll probably get a little more expressive with it. Um, and I'm going to tilt this down. And like I said earlier, I am going to try to do this upside down so that I can see it the right way in the video. But you go ahead and when you're working today, you do whatever you have to do <laughs> to make this a fun process for you. Um, okay, I'm immediately just like, whoa, I'm at a loss. Okay, so it would go like that. I don't know. You know what? No, I don't think it's going to work. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> it is just too much to do that. So I will do it the normal way. Okay, so it goes this way. Okay, what kind of marker am I using? This is um, a brand called Faber-Castell, and it is um, a brush marker like that. And it's, you know, whatever marker you have on hand is what you can use for this today. Um, and you don't even need to, if you wanna just work with a pencil, that's fine. Um, I'm just going to start off with a drawing. Yeah, as soon as I flipped that over, I was like, wait a minute. I was so confused. Uh, <laughs> that wasn't going to work. So I like to start with this sort of... Um, contour drawing, just getting the basics down the eyes, the nose. I'm not doing any major shadowing at this point. And one of the things that's fun about working from life is that you're always moving. Um, so, you know, I'm sitting here and I'm talking, so my mouth is always kind of moving. Um, let's see. Self-portraiture um, among women artists is a really um, wonderful, I guess, like tradition to look into. Um, when I started doing my daily self-portrait practice, um, I became a lot more interested in, you know, the history and the legacy of women's self-portraiture. Self-portraiture allowed women to um, show themselves, um, to take 
control of the way their image was being shown. There's a thing known as the male gaze, <laughs> which you see in movies and art, um, but it's like the way a woman is portrayed via male artists. Um, and it's just kind of interesting to look at how women choose to portray themselves and you know their personal experiences. Um, of course, probably the most well-known, you know, when people think of that, they instantly think of Frida Kahlo uh, because she didn't shy away from showing like some of the more intense aspects of her life. Something that's really interesting that I learned about is that photography actually allowed women um, to be a little more playful and experimental with the way they portrayed themselves because they could bring the camera into their space, their living space, and experiment with like setting up um, situations or experiment with costuming. And that's always fun too with self portraiture is to dress yourself up and, you know, play around with that kind of thing too. Um, all right, so I just did that really quick little drawing here. Um, I like to really, you know, I could just go ahead and start putting some paint down, but I always like to just play around with my materials and just see what happens with them. So um, what do y'all think? What should I use? What material should I use? Maybe I'll use some charcoal. Another thing I like to do is keep these cards handy with little prompts. So let's see if there's something on here that can help us. Illustrate a scene from a favorite piece of music. Spirals. Trace a drip or a stain or a brush stroke. I'm gonna just sort of leave these around and maybe work with them. Use a credit card or a similar card for mark making. Um, glitter. You know, none of these have prompted me in a certain direction. I'm feeling compelled to work with charcoal and then maybe also a little bit with just finger painting. So, you know, oh, this is a um, self-portrait that a friend of mine made that I've been carrying around for a long time. Uh, my friend Angela made that, and I just love it. I really like <laughs> self-portraiture um, from anyone, male or female. It's a really wonderful way to see how people choose to, um, you know, put themselves out there in the world. And I know our, you know, technical, sometimes we're limited by our technical abilities, but even that can be really endearing. Like if you maybe aren't as well practiced with drawing um, or something that can be still really uh, nice to see some of those like, I don't know, maybe more awkward moments um, in, in a portrait. Hey, Lisa. I'm gonna use some of my acrylic glazing medium here and I'm just gonna brush it over these charcoal marks. Uh, what it does is it blends them. And it adheres that charcoal to your canvas. Uh, 
um, artists of color also used self-portraiture to, um, you know, to, to, to represent themselves um, <laughs> the way they want to be represented and not the way maybe, you know, a um, white artist or like a colonist um, history book would have represented them. Um, at a time when modernism and modern art, cubism, all of those things were becoming very popular in Europe, um, you know, the Harlem Renaissance was also happening. And with that, black artists were really trying to just, um, you know, do their portraits in a realistic way and convey themselves um, how they wanted to be portrayed. Wow, this turned into a lot of scribbles. So I'm going to work with some lighter colors now on top of this. And this is like my base right now. You may find when you're experimenting with your materials that different papers, different canvases respond differently. This canvas paper, for example, the paint doesn't dry as fast as it does on paper because it's not as absorbent. So um, the paint tends to sit on it and be wet and um, a little bit more blendable when it's on something like this because it's not a porous piece of paper. All right, so this is kind of just a base for me now. I'm going to use some lighter, more opaque colors and paint on top of this. So I am using, I'm gonna take my Naples yellow, because that's a nice opaque pigment. I'm gonna mix a little bit of my cadmium in there, some cadmium yellow, some cadmium red. I'm just gonna start with that. I mean, you usually have to adjust your colors as you're going. I almost forgot that I should be looking in the mirror right now. When you're working from life, something that's really fun is that the light will change a lot. It's similar to doing plein air painting. If you've ever tried doing landscape painting outside, the paint or the, the light shifts a lot. And if you are working from life, maybe observe where your light source is coming from. Um, is it coming from one direction, two directions? Is one side of your face more in shadow than the other side? Um, you know, those are things you want to be looking at if you're working um, directly from the mirror. Now I'm using a big brush uh, because I like the challenge of trying to get a lot of detail through using a big brush.
So my self-portraits, um, I think a lot of you know at this point, I do a self-portrait every day. Um, and usually just like in 20 minutes or so, I'll do one. And it's something I've been doing for over seven years now. And I often get asked the question, um, why I choose to paint myself like in this kind of raw or rough way. Um, you know, I've had people ask me questions like what, people have asked me if I think I'm really this unattractive, <laughs> which makes me laugh because it's not really about that to me. And, um, you know, someone did write to me and say he was very concerned. He was concerned. He's, he's like, I, I feel like you don't think you're attractive. It was so weird. It was very weird. And, and I thought to myself, like, this isn't even about that. And that's what I mean by the male gaze. Um, like judging, judging the uh, portrait based on whether or not you've portrayed yourself. <laughs> in an attractive way or whatever that means, um, I think is really interesting. Um, because for me, so much of making the painting is about just having fun with the materials and exploring the materials. <clears throat> and <clears throat> when I'm looking at myself every day, I start to <clears throat> not see myself anymore. It's, it's weird, like I'm not making judgments on whether I look pretty in the picture. But I do think we're all, you know, internalized, we all have internalized some of these, you know, these attitudes. And it, it can be hard to break out of it. And it's not even like you need to break out of it. If you don't want to, you don't need to, you know? It's up to you. I guess in my self portraits, I'm more interested in working with the materials and doing different things with the materials and being experimental with the materials um, more than the actual representation of the portrait that I'm creating. I hope that makes sense. There is an artist who has passed away. Um, she's a German artist named Maria Lasnig. And she did a series of self-portraits. <clears throat> I'll share the link in the video description when I'm done here. Um, but she did this thing where she would try to paint the way her body felt. She painted, she lived to be, I believe, in her 90s maybe. And she, maybe late 80s. And she painted, you know, throughout her life. And as she grew older, she tried to portray how her body felt. And her paintings are really um, visceral. They're, they're really, you know, when I first saw them, I was like kind of freaked out <laughs> by them. But, you know, when I learned what they were all about, it was really, they're really fascinating to me. Um, And I've tried to do that myself. It's a little hard. Like she would try to portray the feeling of sitting down, uh, like what that feels like and like physically feels like.
So there's definitely a little more light on this side of my face as I'm looking in the mirror. So I'm going to try to get that um, distinction. One thing I learned when I was researching, you know, in my research of women's self-portraiture is that often the nuns who um, worked on the illuminated manuscripts, um, you know, writing, making drawings um, for biblical stories, um, often they would put, you know, there's a, several examples where they have put their image into the illuminated manuscripts. There was a German nun, I think her name was Gouda, something Gouda, G-U-D-A. And yes, she was notorious for inserting her self-portrait into these <laughs> illuminated manuscripts. Um, in some ways as a, as like a signature. Women often um, in the Italian Renaissance um, and beyond, um, women artists, you know, couldn't, they weren't allowed into the academies to paint, so they would use themselves as um, a model. So they would paint self-portraits for that reason. They'd paint self-portraits for um, almost as like an advertising, like to let people know they were capable of painting a portrait well, so they could get clients, it was like business. Um, a business practice. I like your ideas about how to free up your painting. Thanks, Susan. Something I think is a really good um, challenge is to try to paint with a bigger brush. Um, we tend to get really used to small brushes um, because we're, we're more used to like drawing or you know working with a pencil or something. Um, so that's a fun way to try to free up your paintings is to Try working with the bigger brush. I found some of the most challenging things to me when I'm making a portrait is getting the shadows under things <laughs> like the shadow under the nose is really important. Um, the shadow under the chin. Because you need those shadows to make things look like they're <laughs> sticking out. Often people are afraid to put that shadow under the nose. Because it can so, or under the lip here, because it can so easily like turn into like a weird mustachey <laughs> looking thing.
<clears throat> hey Liz, how's it going? Awesome to see you. <clears throat> I might have to um, end this a little bit early today, um, but yeah, I just wanted to get on here real fast and do some little kind of portrait. I hope everyone is um, working along, maybe working on your own portraits. Let's see, I'm gonna do something with this stuff. I love uh, the phthalo green. It's just one of my favorites. It's just such a bright, kind of over the top color in a lot of ways. Um, I really like, so. I'm going to use that here. My cat has entered the room. I always like to get that little reflection in the eye, in the eyeball there. It might be more prominent the darker your eye, your pupil is. And hair, I like to paint the hair in chunks rather than individual strands. Um, so maybe put a highlight here might be a little bit too much, but yeah.
Did you see her walk by, uh, Liz? I thought I heard you say hi, or I saw you say hi, Juniper. Um, you may have seen her or not. Yeah, she's roaming around. Um, I think she wants to go outside. <laughs> oh, boo. <laughs> she's sitting by the door. <laughs> All right, I'm feeling pretty done with this. Um, you know, you can just keep um, going and going with these things and like keep doing like tons of detail. Um, I usually like to just call it quits after 30 minutes or so. Um, just because I don't like that like little tiny like fussing around. If you find yourself like, you know, people often ask, when is a painting done? And that's like the big question. But if you find yourself like making teeny little itty bitty adjustments here and there, getting too hung up on teeny tiny details and maybe overworking something, I would say maybe put it, put it away for a minute, um, step back, go somewhere else, get some perspective, and then come back to it. Hi, Anne. Um, so I'm gonna call it quits here. I know it's a little early. I usually do this an hour, but um, like I said, I've got a lot going on. Did you see my cat's tail behind me? <laughs> oh, it's in the mirror. Oh, she's up here. Gina Perse, hi. She's like, I'm not doing this. <laughs> Golly. Um, okay. Hey, Joanne, um, look at my cat, she's so cute. All right, I'm gonna call it quits, everyone. I know this is early, um, but I wanted to just do something real quick, real low key, um, because I have a lot of other obligations to get to this week. But um, I will be back next week, and I really appreciate y'all coming on. Fun to see the drawing disappear into the painting. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think that can be a challenge, um, like figuring out, you, you know, like going from drawing into painting for sure. When I hold this up, I'm like, ooh, I'm seeing things popping out that I think I will change like this highlight here. But um, yeah, that's gonna be it. Thanks, Liz. Thanks, Susan. 
Thank you, everyone, and um, I'll see you next week. Bye. I'm going to go play with my kitty cat. <laughs> Bye. Joan, thank you. Fun class. Love color experimentation. Thanks, Joan. Um, okay, bye.